All right, we're getting ready to go here. Sorry, we're a little late. We've been in here chit-chatting. Um, I want to break this into a two-parter, and we'll start with the first part tonight. Uh, we're going to do a fairly deep dive into TPAC. And by a deep dive, what I mean is I want you to be able to understand the differences between these different frameworks that we're going to look at. We're going to be looking at three of them. And the reason why I want you to understand the differences is because all three of these frameworks are very technologically based. The first two are very much technologically based. The first two are all about technology integration. The third, the Universal Design for Learning, the UDL, is all about bringing kids in to the curriculum who cannot be a part of the curriculum. Sorry about that. Who cannot be a part of the curriculum, uh, the mainstream curriculum, and the argument is the child is not broken, it's the curriculum that's broken. Um, so I'm going to do TPAC tonight. We were just talking here earlier that we do have another break, if you want to call it that, coming up on the 21st. So that Thursday, we will not be having class on February 21st. The good news is, the group that will be here from um, the Alt-Cert program, who are all teachers, by the way, who are all working teachers, we're going to be bringing in the OVEC uh, expert on Google Classroom. And he's going to be basically, all these people who are out in the audience will have either have Google Classrooms or have access to creating a Google Classroom. And he is going to basically go through the process of this is what JCPS um, and the state, for that matter, are expecting out of their Google Classrooms. And even the folks that are in the class that are in the archdiocese. So as you can see, everybody has drank the same Kool-Aid about Google. So what I'm going to do that night is I'll go ahead and I'm going to record that presentation that he makes. And then I will post it into our module because after we get done with module two, uh, that will be our next focus is we'll be talking about the ubiquitous classroom. And that will be focused around the Google Classroom. Uh, the ubiquitous classroom, as you know, uh, from your readings is how um, Dr. Fullen describes the classroom that is very elegantly efficient and available 24-7, ubiquitous. And I think that what we are looking at now with the Google Classroom is, is we're past the sort of, this is the nuts and bolts, this is how the thing works. What we need to be having now is the communication and the conversation about how do we make it that irresistibly engaging piece. Because right now all it is is just a fancy dancy homework uh, turn in site. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself and I apologize. Let me jump in here to this. And I'm going to just talk very quickly about theoretical and conceptual frameworks. I hinted at this last week. Um, I'm not going to even play the, the video because you can do that. Let me, just, let me just help you with it this way. Last week we had a, a very far ranging conversation around how educational research can be done. And we talked about effect sizes. Um, and so when you look at various frameworks, when you look at the theoretical side of that framework, what you're looking at are frameworks that lend themselves to research. And when I do TPAC tonight, I'll show you what I mean by that. So TPAC out of these three that we're going to show you is very much a theoretical framework. Meaning, meaning that where you see it employed is mainly in the realm of, so if I tried using this, what happens? 
And then, of course, remember, we talked about this last week with effect size. You have the one group that you use, you do the normal things you do. You have the other group where you apply the difference or you apply the new uh, technology, you apply the new technique, or whatever. And then you compare the two. And what you're trying to get at is that something that you did causes a change. Otherwise, everything stays the same. Remember that? That normal distribution curve? What we're looking for is we're looking for that change that moves the mean of the normal distribution curve. And the closer we get to that one, one standard deviation, either up or down, then we know something's happening. Remember we talked about if the standard deviation goes negative, then what we're trying to do is probably a, a negative kids are not responding or kid, you know, uh, I think the one that someone talked about was bullying. Well, that's a very negative thing to do in an educational situation. So you would expect then it to drop off. The positive one, in other words, getting close to one, um, we would say that something interesting is happening there. This is not to say this is causation. That's the old disclaimer you always have to put out there. So those are theoretical. And so tonight, when we talk about TPAC, I'm going to show you the problems when you look at it through the lens of theoretical that you have. Now, because TPAC is based upon something created by a gentleman by the name of Lee Shulman, who is also a picture hanging on the wall here in the College of Education as a Grandmeyer Award winner, um, Dr. Shulman's work was in the area of pedagogy and content knowledge and how what do we see when, when good teachers are teaching when it comes to pedagogy and content? The T, the technology, was done by two guys by the name of Kohler and Punya. So let me, so that's all I'm going to say about theoretical and conceptual, except when we get done with this and next week when I see you, we're going to be focused on the two conceptual frameworks. And that'll be the TIM. The TIM is nothing more than a checkoff sheet. Um, and I think I have it in here. And the checkoff sheet is basically, so what are kids doing? What are teachers doing? And what you're trying to see there is, do they start to come together? In other words, do we see teacher behavior, student behavior in the use of technology actually start becoming one and the same? Do teachers use technology to research? Do kids use technology to research? Do kids have access to technology to do research? Do teachers use technology for creation of products? Do kids use technology for creation of products of their understanding of the curriculum? So you see, it, it has this sort of sliding look to it. You're, you're looking at these two different areas to see how they mesh with each other. And then finally, universal design for learning is a conceptual framework. I also feel in my heart that it is a philosophical framework as well, because basically what it is saying in really strong um, research language that nothing is harmed when we make the curriculum accessible to some to the benefit of all. And that's a, that's a UDL tagline uh, elevator speech, if you will, that if we do the right things with technology in classroom to bolster the ability for people to participate in the classroom fully, then we are bringing them into the classroom and there's no detriment to anybody else in the classroom. That's UDL. So that's it. That's all I'm going to do about conceptual and theoretical. Now let's jump right in here to TPAC. I am going to, um, again, I'm going to resist playing this little video for you, but I would really like you to look at this and, and watch it. It is a very simple explanation. This is a little more, I'm going to use a kind word and say muddied. And, um, you know, if you want to watch it, you can. It's a long, drawn out, you know, this is what a teacher does. And she goes and talks to the teacher resource, technology resource teacher in the building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I want to do is let's get to the heart of the matter, okay? I'm going to jump down here. 
And I am not going to go through this PowerPoint slide by slide. I'm going to jump through it because you know how I feel about that. No, we're not going to do first things first. Thank you very much. Oh, are you going to let me continue working? Let's go back, try that again then. Go. Ask me later. Sorry about that. And uh, we have it. There we are. Okay, I'm not going to blow this up because when I do, it messes with the Collaborate Ultra. And if you are not seeing this, the PowerPoint is sitting. I think you can see it. Let us look at this model here. This is a very typical model you see in educational research, by the way. Um, it actually has a name. But the thing that is the most important part about this model is you see you have three areas here. I'm sorry, Mark. You have three areas oh, here. here. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm watching it on this. Okay. We have three areas here. Are you actually in Collaborate watching it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And now you can see this? Mm -hmm. All right, good. These three areas, and we'll go through that here in just a second. But the thing that I really want you to see in this model is look at the big circle. And it's called context. And this is very much the added piece to when we put technology in here. And as we go through it, I will show you how uh, the work that was originally done by Shulman was built upon. And what the guys were doing is they were looking for a way to see how technology fit. And in the Shulman model, the problem was it needed an extra larger framework, and that's where the context comes from. But let's let's take a look at this real fast. TPAC integrating technology into teaching, it's a wicked problem. Wicked problems are actually truly a uh, sociological um, definition. It's not a made up cutie thing. It's uh, very much a understandable d definition. Um, and as you can see, you see where Churchman says requirements are incomplete, contradictory and changing, no two problems are the same, solutions are difficult to realize, no solutions are right and wrong, solutions do not have stopping rules. Why do we say this? One of the things that we keep seeing over and over and over again in the 20 some odd years that I have been involved with technology, no, 30 some odd years I've been involved with technology, is this is the perfect definition of technology in schools. Um, we try to make it fit into a plan, but then in two years, three years, the technology has moved on from whatever we did. Uh, Google Classroom, perfect example, perfect example. In three years, there'll be something different. There'll be something totally different than Google Classroom. Microsoft may have fought back by then <laughs> and figured out a way to make the uh, Office 365 a cloud-based uh, learning platform and they'll be giving away for free you know so this is this is why technology and education is so difficult because technology education by its very definition extremely slow for change it just doesn't happen uh, in another class that I teach, we, we learn about something called paradigm shifts. Um, and that's based upon works by a gentleman by the name of Thomas Kuhn, who is basically looking at how do new ideas get into science? Because science is also a very um, evidence-laden area where you, if you come in with a new idea, it's very, very difficult for you to get that new idea accepted into the scientific community unless you have got tons and tons and tons of evidence and if it represents a paradigm shift then you have to go all the way back to square one in other words you start all over again um, simple example galileo looking up into the night sky through his telescope began to realize that the way things moved in the heavens the earth could not be the center of the heavens 
and that the whole idea of astronomy back to square one. Anyway, so wicked problems. It's a it's a true uh, social science term, and I'm not going to go through these. These are all those you know quotes that you're supposed to throw in. Let's get to the heart of the matter. When you look at TPAC, it looks at three different areas. So it's looking at teacher knowledge, the content. So do you know what you're doing? Do you know your stuff? And then we also look at pedagogy, which is that deep knowledge about understanding how to teach that stuff. Now, this has been around since day one. TPAC, I mean, uh, PCK, pedagogy and content have been around day one. What happened was when Lee Shulman came along in 1987, not that long ago, really, in terms of research, he basically came along and he said this very simple thing. In considering the relationship between content and pedagogy, the key question is how disciplines differ from each other and whether disciplines can or should be taught through the same instructional strategies. Now, if you've been teaching for a while, and you heard that, your first reaction ought to be, well, duh, Steve, yes. So what he was trying to get at, and I call this the pedagogical slide or the pedagogical dance, is what Shulman was saying was, when we teach, we have to move out of these different pedagogical ways for the content then to have true meaning to students. Now, the guys who do um, another acronym, we just full of acronyms in education. Uh, the UBD fellas, Wiggins and McTighe, understanding by design, UBD, they maintain that all education is about application into real life situations. And what pedagogy, what, what pedagogy and content dancing, sliding, Schulman's idea is what we should do is there'll have to be times when content has to be this is what this is. This is how it fits. Now let's put you in groups and let's explore how this is and how it fits into the bigger ideas about what we've been learning. So see, we have to have those pedagogical moments where we're doing teaching one way, but then for it to have real impact on kids learning in honor of Wiggins and McTeague and their ideas, then we need to shift and change the pedagogy. It's as simple as that. And if you go in and watch good teachers, you see that happening all the time. Now, bad teaching is what I sit here and do. I'm sitting here yakking at you. Um, that's not good. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you some basis so that then when we go in and look at the work that we're going to do for this in the blend space, you have some ideas of what you're looking for. Now, to me, this is one of the, the hearts, one of the, one of the main ideas of all teaching. So if you see up here where it says, if those perceptions are misconceptions, in other words, when kids bring ideas into the classroom, a lot of times they bring in misconceptions. I'll give you an example. And I've seen this a million times in elementary schools. Kids are starting to be taught letter sounds. Usually it's in, in uh, kindergarten. And so the teacher will be trying to equate letter sounds to experiences the kids might have. So they'll hold up and they're teaching the letter sound of M. And they'll hold up a cow and they'll say to the children sitting in the room, what sound does a cow make? Now, as experienced adults, we all understand what's happening here. We're, we're expecting kids to say moo, and the teacher then moves on to the, yes, the mmm sound. What you find is kids who are sitting in the classroom who have very limited experiential knowledge, and this has nothing to do with race, by the way. It has more to do with SES than it has to do with anything else. But they're not going to know that cows go moo. No one ever read them a book. No one ever took them to a farm. And the only TV they watched was baseball games or football games or wrestling. Okay, so you see this all the time. Then he goes on to say 
that those preconceptions that are now misconceptions, teachers need knowledge of strategies most likely to be fruitful in reorganizing the understanding of learners because those learners are unlikely to appear before them as blank slates. You see this all the time in math classes, especially in middle school math classes, where we're trying to move kids more into the um, way of computing, especially when we're working with equations, algebraic expressions, into sort of more of the quote unquote mainstream, although you're seeing more and more of that kind of work being done with applied math. I won't get into that uh, argument. But when you, you see that there, you'll see kids coming in who have all these shortcuts, all these different ways of doing math. And then all of a sudden they're confronted with, no, we have to do it this way. I had a lady, um, one of my students was talking to me about, she was trying to teach kids about long division. And she was showing them all the different ways that you can compute long division, as well as trying to follow the way that the uh, district curricular has it. And she said, it's very confusing because there's so many different ways. And I said, that's a perfect example of PCK, that when we're dealing with stuff like that, we have to have ready in our teacher toolbox, the different pedagogical approaches to help kids understand and make that exploratory adventure to realize that that is the case. We're not trying to just to shove one way into kids' heads. We're trying to give kids an understanding that there's lots of ways of, of looking at the knowledge that we're learning. There are some basic things that we just have to know. Four times four is 16. Five plus five, plus five is 10. When we divide and we have a remainder, this is what it means. You know, we have to have those basic knowledge blocks. No one's saying we don't, but we also have to understand that within this, we have uh, to understand that there are different ways of looking at it. Now, this little cartoon, which is, I'll get to it, but I'll go ahead and show it to you. She says, uh, I asked my catering students to take everything with a grain of salt but with my plasters, I lay it on with a trowel. This is the meaning of context. We'll come back to it here in just a second. I probably should move that around. Now, here we go. This is where now we get involved, and that's with the technology. So now, as you can see, we have this technology as the intersection of the three bodies of knowledge. Understanding goes beyond the knowledge of each in isolation. Instead, it is more about how they interact with each other. Schulman's work basically looked at, do you know your content? Do you understand your content so well that when you get to certain parts of the content, you know to make the pedagogical slide? I need to teach you the vocabulary, so therefore we're going to do it this way. But then I'm going to make a pedagogical slide where you're going to make application of the vocabulary. You're going to make application of the vocabulary in a collaborative uh, group report or in a collaborative group challenge. You know, you're moving, you're going to do deep inquiry. What does this word mean? Where did the word come from? You do those kinds of pedagogical slides and you're constantly changing up that based upon context. My first context is you need to understand what this thing is called. These are the words that we use to define this thing. Here is how it looks. And then we slide over here, and we slide over here, we slide over here. Now technology, when it comes in, really changes this dynamic because it works at multiple layers. And you know this, you intuitively know this. Anybody who's been a teacher in a classroom where there's technology knows that part of what we do every time we turn on our computers and our projectors is we sit here and we go, please work, please, oh God, work, please, oh God, work. That's one layer. You have to have the technological knowledge to understand how a thing works or a piece of software works or a web app works. And then you also have to have the knowledge of where does it fit? I'm going to jump through some more of these because we don't need to be looking at that. 
Um, this is the thing about uh, preparing teachers to teach with technology, the guiding development of TPAC. And these are the challenges. This is, you know, goes back to the uh, wicked problem first stated. Is it impossible to do? No, it's not. You have to understand that it is a wicked problem, first and foremost. For us to be able to look at it, we need creative solutions. The solution should be seen as novelty. So in other words, creativity is a part of the novelty of it. Novelty must be joined to purpose and be effective and for the whole thing to be holistic. So the acronym, the other acronym that the two, two guys came up with that do the TPAC is new, novel, effective, and whole. So the new is, hey, we're going to use this thing called blend space. Blend space is very much a linear tool. In other words, it's very much, here's a box, here's a box, here's a box, here's a box, but we can put things into it. What can we put into it? Anything you want. Hey, here's a tool called pick the chart where we can make a thing called an infographic, which allows you to speak visually as well as through the written word to your audience to explain a point. So we have the novel, it's new, it's different. Do we have the effective? So if we do the picture charts, if we do the infographics and we don't see that people see them as being effective way of presenting their understandings, it really has no purpose. That goes back to my corollary, remember? If it takes you more than 15 minutes to explain to a kid how to use a piece of software or a web app, then don't do it. It's just not worth your time because it should be effective. It should be effective in the sense that it is something that is elegantly efficient, as Dr. Fullen says. It should be something that once you do it, you have the skinny, again, as Fullen says. So the next time you do it, it should be easier. That is why I break up the book the way I do, chapters two and three, four and five. They do break up very nicely, but the point was in chapters two and three, I had to show you how the picture chart worked. You did the infographic in chapters four and five was more of a, now that you know how to do it, go and do it. That's a classic example of the elegantly efficient skinny that Dr. Fullen talks about. In this particular case, in this framework, when we look at TPAC, what we're looking at is, does it, does it have an effectiveness to it that it can represent a way of truly demonstrating a kid's understanding of whatever it is you're asking them to do? You see this a lot in mathematics instruction, or you see it a lot in science instruction, where you ask kids to build models, do demonstrations. And you see it a lot in writing where you ask kids to write to a particular piece or transactional, you know, writing for understanding uh, technically. You know, you, we do this all the time. So we're building models. And what the TPAC guys say is when technology gets introduced into that, is it effective in the sense that it slides away? It slides away and the purpose becomes front and center. It becomes the piece. And then the last one, the whole, is that classic holistic idea. Is everything in this connected? Now, one of the things uh, that the TPAC guys have said and will and continue to say is that when you're looking at using technology and you look at the TPAC model, let me jump back a few slides here. And you're looking at the TPAC model, model uh, they goofed. And I'll show you what I mean. And this is so classic of what we do with technology integration. So classic. Okay, so take a look at this. What do you see at the top of the model? Technology knowledge. And so it appears that the, that the model is saying the first consideration is technology. 
Nope. It should be the last. The first consideration is what is the content that I'm trying to teach? What is the pedagogy that I'm going to use in teaching that? And then, and then does technology fit? Again, this is another trap we fall into in schools is that we think we have to use technology for everything we do. And that's not true. Um, technology, when you look at it through the lens of the PCK model, Schulman's model, becomes a part of the teacher's toolbox. It's not the beginning. It's not the ultimate. It is a piece of the teacher's toolbox. So when we look at the wicked problem that is teaching with technology, we need to look at it through this acronym that uh, Kohler and, and Mishra came up with, which is the novel, effective, and whole. And when we look at it that way, I would argue we also need to hear Fullen over here whispering in our ear about is it elegantly efficient? Does it meet the idea of the skinny? Once I get it, I got it, I can use it now, and I can then expand its use and apply it to different challenges. And is it something that makes new meaning? In other words, does it give something extra to the idea? A uh, perfect example of this. I was, uh, when I was working in schools, I had a school that I went to that I loved to death, a Rutherford Elementary. And the reason why I loved Rutherford Elementary was the level of teaching in that building was astounding, just over the top, incredibly good. The kids who came to that building did not come from well-off backgrounds. They came from the building from the Americana Apartments. There was a great deal of Vietnamese kids that were in the, in the building. Uh, and then there was the, you know, the classic normal uh, South End kids, black, white. But there was this wonderful soup of kids who really wanted to learn. And they had parents behind them who were pushing. And so everything they did in their classes culminated in a project that they did collaboratively working with each other. Um, and then there were demonstrations at the end. I, you know, I called them the poster children. Because <laughs> everything they did ended up on a poster. And it was really an interesting we, I, when I got there, we had just started putting technology um, in large formats into schools. By that, I mean we're talking about laptop carts. And so we had laptop carts in that school where there were these white uh, Mac laptops that we could roll into a classroom. And so we tried to do things differently using the laptops. And what we found was unless we could come up with something that was very much different, that brought a different dimension, the kids were perfectly happy making posters because it was something they knew. And they really enjoyed the idea of, of doing the writing on the poster and the cutting and the pasting. And, you know, um, then of course they brought in um, a cutting machine. And so they were able to make their own letters. I mean, you know, went on and on and on. And so technology in that, all we had back then was, hey, look, we could make a PowerPoint. It just didn't have the difference to make kids really want to change. And the teachers, and the teachers were so enamored with the way the kids were doing it because their classes were always busy. Their classes were full of very bright kids who were on task, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a very diverse population of kids that worked well together. It wasn't until we moved into things where kids could actually create videos that that dynamic then markedly changed. And then when we came in 
And, and that was using something called iMovie. And that was difficult because people couldn't understand how to do iMovie. But then when we came to a platform online that did the same thing, but it was extremely simple to use, then kids changed and their presentations changed because they carried around in their head this image of what a video movie would be like. And so then the questions were, could we put this into our video? Why not? Could we make simple costumes and acting out? Why not? And so when we got to that level of sophistication, the pedagogy changed. Technology forces change, but we can't force technology to make change. We have to look at how does it impact pedagogy and how does it impact content knowledge. Now, the other thing the guys make a big deal about, and this is another one of their mantras, and I leave this one because I, frankly I've gotten in trouble when I've done presentations at state level and the national level on this because people come up to me and they go, that's not what they meant. That's not what they meant. I'm Dr. So-and-so from so-and-so, and that's not what they meant. And here's what's funny about that. I actually have met these two guys. They're uh, hilarious. They're, they're very funny. Uh, and their presentation, and the, their presentations are here, by the way, if you want to watch it. And it's really nicely done. Um, Mishra has this part of his presentation where he says he goes to the bathroom and he uh, finds a bug in the urinal and he goes on about how the bug represents, you know, things we have in software that causes teachers not to want to use it and so on. It's, it's hilarious. But this one, I think, just reverberates in me. This is the part that I think that we fail teachers at. When we think about affordances, well, an affordance is nothing more than something that allows you to do something else. The brakes on your car are the affordance that allows you to stop the car. So if the technology use in your classroom, if we think of it as an affordance to allow kids multiple demonstrations of understandings, then we have an affordance that allows kids to plug into understandings of the curricular in different ways. So those kids who um, may not be good writers may be darn good videographers. Or those kids who need to express themselves visually. So their line goes like this. Affordances that teachers create, in other words, what teachers use in their classroom that are based on technology can only happen until there's playful interaction with that technology within the context of their curriculum. Now, as the person who used to be in charge of this in Jefferson County, I can tell you we failed at this miserably. Uh, one of the first things we did when we first started giving teachers laptops a million years ago is we brought people in and they, before they could get their laptop, they had to come for uh, six hours worth of training over two nights. Um, and of course, we paid them a stipend as well as giving them the laptop and the projector. And what we found right away was we were spending way too much time on the triviality of the laptop. This is how you turn it on. This is how you make the screen rotate. This is how you tie on the stylus that you're going to be using on your uh, touch screen that your HP uh, laptop has. We spent way too much time on that. Gave people opportunities to playfully interact with that. We forgot that last word there, the C word. So how would you use this in your curriculum? When we realized what we had done, 
we tried to make up for that by bringing in markers, in other words, teachers who were using the technology in ways that we thought were really good examples. And these folks were excellent, excellent users of technology in their classrooms. But we still missed out on that playful interaction piece there. So I'd bring a guy in. We had a guy that taught in middle school math. And I'll never forget his stuff because he covered the waterfront. He used the technology and the, the ability to put up colored slides to alert kids to this is what we're going to be doing next. Here's what's coming. And so his classroom management basically was so simplified because the kids would look up and they say, oh, Mr. Glass, we're getting ready for this. OK. And if, and because he was such a hands on kind of teacher, he would always be rotating and moving throughout the classroom and kids will be saying, what are we doing next? What is color? Is it up on the screen? Oh, OK. You know, and it was masterful. And then, of course, he was using it to teach mathematics. And the thing he would do would be, again, he would be out in the audience, be out in the classroom, and he would say, Joe, go up there and take the, the stylus, please, and show us how to X, Y, and Z up on the screen. He was just masterful. He was masterful at it. Uh, and then the last piece was, of course, he was saving all this because at the time you could do screen recording. You could just basically save each separate screen through a, a product. It was a simple product, but it was it was on every Windows machine, so it wasn't hard to do. Did we allow teachers to understand how to do that? Nope. Just showed it to them. This is an old slide, so forgive me. Those of you who have been around this game for a while are probably looking at this slide going, what? So let's just say that we need to understand the knobs. Now I'm going to jump quickly through it. Um, these are old knobs is the reason why I am. The only one of these that's still around is VoiceThread. VoiceThread is still around. We're going to be using this knob, except it's, except it's now called the Beyond. Uh, it's, I call this uh, more fun than a box of puppies, or if you don't enjoy using Vion, then your soul is dead because it's that engaging. Uh, and I've used Vion with everything from second graders to high school seniors, give you an idea. Uh, and then Storybird. Um, I find that what Storybird has evolved into is an amazing ability to get kids engaged in the writing process because it acknowledges the fact that all understanding, that all reading, understanding of doing reading starts with a very simple idea, pictures and words, pictures and words, pictures and words. And what Storybird does is it takes that to the level of where you are allowed to use copyrighted uh, illustrations by a specific illustrator to create your own storybooks. And it fits in so nicely with so many. It's so steamy. How about that? It is so steam in the sense that you can talk about the different illustrators and the artists. You can talk about the writers and how the artists and the writers go together. It's, it's just an incredible thing. Uh, and then the final piece that makes it even more incredible is you can print it out, make your own book. Or heck, you could even have the books made into hardback or paperback books. Um, I worked with a librarian. I've worked with lots of librarians with Storybird and kids making their own books. And then uh, the librarian would print off the best and they kept them in a special section in the library for kids' work. Good stuff. We're not going to talk about podcasting. We're going to jump to this. All right. So let me take a look at this. This speaks very eloquently to that whole teachers having the opportunity for creative interactions with technology and their curriculum. And until we do that, we don't see it working. Now, this is a fancy dancy uh, slide that I created years and years ago based upon the work by this lady up here, Maggie Neese, who is out of the University of Oregon. Um, Maggie is a mathematical professor. 
Uh, she would be like our Dr. Peters here at U of L or Dr. Bay Williams. She is a name. And what Maggie's ideas are, and there's see, there's a lot of people who have built upon the TPAC work. Um, Maggie's won our own Bob Roano here that used to be here. It's now at the University of Cincinnati. Bob is the one who taught me all about TPAC. Um, and then there's Judy Harris. Judy Harris is a name, a light. Um, in fact, Judy has taken the baton of TPAC and now she owns it and she runs a blog and so on about TPAC. Uh, Judy Harris, if you don't know who Judy Harris is, she is a name you ought to know. Uh, she is the creator of the ideas about that our first introduction of the web children is that they were hunter gatherers that basically they were just going out and finding things on the web um, and the perfect example of that is the web quest the bernie dodge web quest now we have morphed into the prosumers that kids now should be going out and they should be farmers and they should be planting ideas and growing ideas and they should be creating ideas that can exist on the web. So let's look at this real fast. So that first understandings, when we first introduce technology to teachers, we see that they're able to use the technology and understand how it could be used for subject matter, but yet do not integrate it. And you know what that means. The teacher who's got the laptop on in the classroom and they're showing a YouTube video. Or even simpler than that, the teacher who's using Infinite Campus to do the role and grades, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know that because that's the expectation we have now of teachers. Well, if you can't integrate it, at least you can keep your, you can keep the attendance in your grades. Now, when we then step in, and when I say we, uh, you understand that I'm talking to you as people who are interested in this, who I refer to as technologists. In other words, you, you've, you're drinking the Kool-Aid or you've already drinking the Kool-Aid and you believe in what we're talking about here. And so when we step in, what happens is teachers will form an unfavorable or favorable attitude toward using technology for teaching and learning subject matter. And this is where that tenet that mantra of TPAC must occur. Teachers must have the time. Teachers must have the support. Teachers much ha must have the fail-safe environment to explore its use and then make the connection over to their curriculum. Right now, one of the things that I'm seeing going on out there in schools is with Google Classroom. We're seeing Google Classroom. People are being told, use Google Classroom. What, 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 how? Well, you know, you use it. And then was the digital backpacks. You know, we're seeing that the digital backpack thing in Jefferson County, at least, what's happening is you're getting a little bit of knowledge through these uh, videos and, you know, join us for a live discussion of the digital backpack. And they've got tons and tons of these videos out there now. Are we actually having a chance for teachers on site to sit and play, yes, play, and understand what am I creating and how does it go and what is its purpose. So at that point, if you have an unfavorable reaction to technology use, you're done. You're done. And just like anything, and you know this, negative reinforcement, when you apply negative reinforcement to somebody, to then come back and expect them to then behave, if you want, with the appropriate way, it is a really, really hard thing to overcome. And especially in teaching, because when you put yourself out there in a situation where you're using a piece of technology, and if you haven't had the chance to use it enough to know well, it's just the US, uh, USB cable just came undone. Or whoops, uh, hold on everybody, let me plug the, you know, the video cable back in. When you, when you don't have the opportunity to, ha to have experiences with that, when it happens in your classroom, oh my God, it just all falls apart. 
you could spot a good teacher who's had experience with technology in a heartbeat because when something goes wrong, they don't miss a beat. They automatically go to plan B or they automatically go and check what they know is probably the, the cause and they go right back in and the kids don't miss a beat. And so then what we see is if we get into the recognizing part of it, in other words, I need to know how to use Google Classroom. If all the teacher gets from that is it's a turn in space or it's a doorway into the digital backpack, but they never form a favorable opinion of how it can move discussions forward in class. Now, kids could do demonstrations of understanding within the classroom that other kids can see, and then you could have this rich soup of dialogue commenting back and forth about it. And then within that framework, we have to understand what civil discourse means. In other words, you don't go in and say, you're stupid. That's the wrong answer, stupid. You know, we don't have that. What we have are those questions that we ask each other in a civil, polite way. Is this what you meant? I didn't see that before. Oh, we better look at this again. And it's not hard to teach kids to do that. It is not hard to teach kids to do that. But in our day and age, we have to teach that. That's what the whole care thing was all about. We have to teach kids how to have civil discourse. If we have acceptance of that, and if we have the ability for teachers to use it, then what we see is teachers will start implementing tech in their classroom instruction leaving them to a choice to adapt issues for teaching that content. So we see teachers who use tools that they can get through the use of technology in their classrooms. And then what they'll see is there's an opportunity there then for that technology to bring something back that they can then utilize with kids to do dem demonstrations of understanding or help kids to understand the content they're trying to do. Uh, Brain Pop, good example. Brain Pop um, is used extensively in elementary schools. And when we first bought it back in the day, when I was in charge of this stuff, what we liked about the Brain Pop was we bought it so that kids could use it when they were outside of school. And we were very aware of the digital divide at that time. You know, people didn't, computers weren't as ubiquitous in, in homes as they are now. And my God, I think the iPhone, no, the iPhone wasn't even, didn't even exist. Laptops had just come onto the scene. And so we bought BrainPop because what we liked about it was Kids could go back and watch the videos. We found that they were good. Uh, content was good. We found that the content was consistent. Um, and it was, it was sort of engaging. I mean, the robot was a little bit goofy, but you know, but the pictures were clear. The content was clear. Uh, we liked it a lot, but here's what we really liked about it. Since we bought it, lock, stock, and barrel, we had the ability for kids because those of you who have used it know at the end there's a little, little quizzes. And so what we were able to do is when the kids got to the end of the brain pops, they could take the quiz and then it would email it back to the teacher. And so what we found were teachers would introduce the brain pops in school, kids take quiz. Then they would recommend to them to go home and take it again or to watch it again, take the quiz again. And then we'd see if there was a difference in the scores. Well, of course, you knew they would go up because they'd seen it already. But it was it was it was a really interesting idea. It was a way ahead of its time. I mean, you know, um, Facebook. I think MySpace was kind of out there. Facebook wasn't even around. So that's why we really liked Brain Pop. And what we found teachers doing with it was, is they saw a way to have kids become more engaged in the content, but yet at the same time, have a way of then being able to find out if they knew what was going on. It's still around, I hear. Uh, 
when we tried to actually do some research about brain pop in Jefferson County Public Schools, and I contacted the brain pop people, I was what I was looking for was I wanted to know uh, the logins. Remember, everybody had a login. Uh, and the login back then was based upon the same login that kids have today, their network logins. And so what we were doing was, is we were trying to get them to tell us how many times did see, and we, we randomly picked schools, and then we randomly picked kids, how many times did we see little Johnny Miller, who is at Atkinson Elementary, how many times did we see him logging in and then how many times did we see that he took the quiz and what were his scores? And the sad part about that was the brain pop people couldn't give me that kind of data. They could tell me that, oh, you all are using it a lot. <laughs> well, yeah. But they couldn't tell me that we were using it a lot at 12 a.m. or 5 p.m. or at you know 1 p.m. They couldn't even give me that kind of granularity in the data. But we hung on to it because we thought it was it, it it's good uh, content. Finally, if we really are invested in using technology, we will make revisions in their, curric in their curriculum as a result of the technology capabilities and evaluate the results. One la let me give you an example of that. Former student of mine uh, who teaches out at uh, Greenwood Elementary. Greenwood, when they got their first Chromebooks, she came to me and was asking me questions about um, how we could use Chromebooks. And frankly, I had never seen a Chromebook. I'd seen plenty of the little tiny notebooks that uh, people were trying to use in schools as a teaching tool. Uh, but I had never seen a Chromebook. Actually, I had seen a Chromebook. And this lady brought it to me and said, how do you work this? And I was looking at it and I go, well, it looks like you need to be on the internet at all times. Okay, how do I do that? Well, it's called Wi-Fi. Move forward three years. Now, all of a sudden, Chromebooks are in schools. And so here she is. She brings it back to me and she says, how can we use this? I go out and I buy my own Chromebook, an Acer. Uh, cost me all $320, and it looks just like my MacBook Pro. It even has the backlit keyboard and everything. It's a beautiful computer. And then I started looking at the Chrome experience, because that's what you use, that's the OS. And it was like, holy smokes. So within the Chrome OS for all these extensions that allowed you to do things like record yourself, make a movie, do demonstrations, and I go back to her and I say, Stephanie, here's what I've been playing with. What do you think? Now, if you think about it, where was she in this continuum? Well, she's already up here. She's in the accepting, you know, playing around with technology, trying to understand how to use it. And then all of a sudden she's handed a class set of Chromebooks. So then I get invited to her class just to come out and kind of see what's going on. First thing I noticed was when I walked in, the Chromebooks, even though she had enough for every kid to be a one-to-one, -one, she had them in groups of three. And the groups were divided up into uh, content uh, specific parts of the curriculum. In other words, that was social studies. And they were studying um, uh, the various Native American uh, tribes in uh, the United States at the beginning. And uh, those of you who teach that, you know it's all very much in territory, southeastern, northeastern, central plains, northwestern, so on, southwestern. So it was, it was an easy thing to break up into groups. Here's what she had done. She had told the kids that they were responsible for coming up with a documentary that would help us understand the culture of the various tribes, history, interaction with the white settlers and today and to end with a public service announcement about how the Native Americans of that particular area are viewed positively negatively um, 
it was an amazing thing to watch. And so what was happening was, and I asked her, I said, why aren't you doing this one-to-one? -one? She goes, I really want them to use the computer to do research, but I want the research then to then be created in a different format. I don't want them just pasting, you know, copy paste in. I want them to put it into their own words. I want them to have rich discussions about this is what we're going to say. This is what we're going to show, et cetera, et cetera. She had kids in that room. It didn't matter. Boy, girl, black, white, Hispanic, it didn't matter. She had kids in that room that were just like intuitively videographers. I mean, they were just amazing videographers. Now, why did she drag me into this besides just being one of my students? She wanted to show off. She thought it would be really cool to do green screen. Well, that's about as high up on the ladder of, of technology use in a class. Well, no, not anymore, but it's pretty up there. And so I brought in my toys that I have over here in my office and basically told the kids, this is how it works. And the kids were like, oh, so we're basically going to film in front of that thing. And then on our Chrome Chromebooks, we can play with changing it to using a green screen and chroma keying and getting rid of the background and putting in the background we want. Right. But it only takes three steps. Right. It only takes three steps. In other words, it has become that simple of a process to do now that you can walk into a classroom and using the Steve Corollary, 15 minutes, show you how to do it. Can you do it? Sure. Get out of my way. It, that was all it took. And then to watch the kids go nuts with things like, so if I put the, the green screen, the, the sheet, <laughs> if I put it over uh, this table or these chairs or these boxes, I can have like a three-dimensional object in the shot. Yep. So if I want to have a person hiding behind a box, or if I want a person to come out from behind a tree, if I want to have a person walking out of a building, I can do that. I don't know. And then they go try it and they come back. Yeah, we figured out how to do that. Oh, we can make, we can show you how you can be flying through space. We figured out how to do that. And then they started playing with perspective because they got tired of that flat, you know, two dimensional looking look at it. And they were like, we'd like to have it to where you're at an angle. So it looks like the perspective is going off into the distance and do that with the green screen. Why can't you? Okay, we're going to go try. And they would just go in and play. But behind that play was always the certainty of what Miss Mudd curriculum content was asking them to do. Now, what is, what is the fly in this ointment? What is the problem in this? And you know what it is. Every good teacher knows what it is. It's time. And so what, when she first did it for the first time, she kind of stumbled through it. And that's why she had me there. And she stumbled through it. And then her colleagues that came in to see what she was doing were kind of like, I'm not going to do that. I don't have that time. And so when I got invited back last year, what did I see? Things were much smoother. Things were much more elegantly efficient. And she had greatly shortened the time down from a month long to a week. Because now she knew, she knew how to take that small group of kinesthetic learners who have to have their hands on everything and she put them together in a small group where she taught them in 15 minutes or less how to use the software, how to use the green screen. And then she seated them back into the collaborative groups done. So that piece was already done. The research piece, primary sources, not secondary, all that was a part of her curriculum that she had taught. So all the structure that existed, existed. And she didn't have to make that up. 
the extra structure about kids doing research and coming up with these mini documentaries and these PSAs where she was expanding the curriculum, the technology came in and it helped with the expansion, but it was never front and center. It was always her teaching about the various Native American groups. Okay, I'm almost done, Mark. Mark's over here going, wow. Now, what is the problem with this model? I'm going to show it with my cursor, Mark, and not go up here on the screen. I see two serious problems with it. Number one is, a, you know, number one is a stylistic problem. I've always maintained that it ought to be called CPET. Content Pedagogical Technology Knowledge. Um, because when you put the T in front, there is an allusion to the fact that T is first and foremost. It is not. Secondly, the model has the T at the top. Again, goes against what the TPAC is supposed to be doing. Now, the other part of my problem with it is more related to uh, a research focus than anything else. So forgive me uh, if I wander off into this, and I won't promise I won't do it for very long. If you look at how many different interactions there are here in this model, Let's see if we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have 12. My cursor just went away. Where'd you go, cursor? There are 12. Remember what we talked about with effect size and how we do research? You go in and what you're looking at is so how do content and pedagogy play off of each other? So if we go in and we do uh, observing teacher behaviors and student behaviors. So if a teacher sits like he's doing tonight and talks to you for an hour and a half, do you actually learn something? As opposed to let's put you in an online environment where you can watch videos and, and receive it in other ways. What if we put you into a group and in the group you watch the video together and you try to, okay. Then you look at how people perform. When I add the T pack, when I add the T into that, how do I add that in? Because now I've got this three thing going on here. Now you could argue, you could say, well, well, Steve, you're, you're looking at and you're saying, well, does the technology help with the content understanding? Right. And we're looking for the effect size of does the technology help me understand? Usually done through what? Here's the technology, do stuff with the technology, take a test, how'd you do? What am I leaving out? I just left out the pedagogy. You see the problem? The problem is this is a hard model to get your hands around to do any of that sort of research. And of course, what does that come back to then? Dun, da, da, dun. It comes back to any time that we try to use technology integrated into teaching, it becomes a wicked problem. And as the boys say, if you listen to their, let me see here. Let's see if I can, um, let's see if this link works. Mark, let's see if we can actually have this work for us. So I'm going to zoom in here. And let's see if I can get this to play. Nope, not going to play. What we'd be saying here is, let's sing along. And they don't really sing. There is no royal road to using 
technology and education. In other words, there's no one, here's how you do it. And if you remember back, remember back to Hattie from our Fullen work, what did he say? That there's very little that we can do in teaching that does not have a positive effect on kids learning, which just makes you stop and blink. Now there's all kinds of things we can do in teaching to have negative effects on kids. And we don't want to go there because we know we all don't do that. But what the, what they're saying is there is no Royal road. Let's give every kid an iPad. Are we going to have a really amazing things happen there? Will kids develop things new, exciting, and interesting? They would argue, no, not until you have teachers who have such a high level of comfort and recognition of how technology can be used in their classroom in their content. All technology use in the classroom cannot happen until there is playful interaction with the technology by the teacher within the framework, the context of their content. Going back to that big circle around those circles. We must realize that everybody's context is not the same. So there's no royal road. We can't just walk in and say, here's the technology, go ahead and use it. We're going to give everybody a Google Classroom, use it. We can't do that. And then the last piece that harkens back to Fullen is this idea that technology as a change agent must meet must meet those criteria that he lays out that it must be elegantly efficient it must be intrinsically engaging in other words woo, i kind of like that and it must be ubiquitous 20, available 24 7 and it must have consequence it must change something it must do something and if we don't have that then once again we're stuck with so what are we using this for I had a gentleman in here earlier with Mark and I who was talking about his kid uh, has, uh, is one of the schools that have the iPads for every kid in the building. And one of the kids in the school discovered a way to get past the management software on the iPad. I was wondering when that was going to happen because you can't ever stop kids from getting past management software. Um, and so they were able to, um, well, I can tell you, they were able to figure out a way to get past the management software by uh, there's a suite of iPad apps they are allowed to get to in the Apple store. And if you know how to do that on your phone or your iPad, you know what I'm talking about. So they were going in and the district and I think Verizon, I'm not sure, had basically allowed for certain apps to be available within the store for kids to have. And so the idea would be um, when Mark and I were teaching in our classrooms, we would say to kids, okay, we're going to need to get, I'm going to look at my friend over here. What do you call the star? Is it called star map, Mark, where you can hold it up and you, it literally shows you the sky? Oh, yeah. Is that it, star map? Yeah. Okay. So Mark works over the planetarium. And I can remember back in the day, one of the first things that, that um, we started using our iPads for was that really cool way of being able to walk at it at night, hold it up and go, oh, that's where Co is. Or, oh, that's what Orion looks like. Um, so those, those apps were in the app store. And then when you got to ready to use them, you would tell kids, I need you to go in and download the app, the Star, Star Walk, one Star Map, it's called Star Walk. And what kids figured out was if they just went in and started downloading all the apps as fast as they could, all the apps as fast as they could, it would unblock access to the entire app store, <laughs> regardless. And when they realized what was going on and they started looking at the iPads because they can do that, what did they find that they had on there? 
you know, you know as well as I do. It's games. You know, I think this thing that we have about the kids are going to get into stuff that's going to damage them for life is such a anomaly. I remember when we had uh, one-to-ones and we had kids that were using laptops and they were going off well, what the, the teachers wanted them to look at. And there were adults at the school board who were going, they're looking at these awful things. And we did the research. We went and looked at what kids were looking at that was not uh, part of the curriculum. And the number one thing that we found that they were looking at was shoes, athletic shoes. Porn was way down the list. Rappers were high. You know, saw a lot of rapper pictures. And then kids figured out how to get around the barriers to then putting that as your you know, background, as your wallpaper on your computer. That's a losing battle, if you ask me. But I understand it. I do understand the need for that. Okay, let me show you how we're going to do the skinny um, and where those resources lie. First of all, I want to thank uh, Heather, who um, had texted me that she, Heather, is in the great beyond. And Heather had already looked at this, and she gave me the heads up that one of the links in here wasn't going to the right place. And thank you very much, Heather, for letting me know that. They're now fixed. So let me get down here to it. And again, I apologize for making all of you seasick. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at a tool called Blend Space. And I'm gonna show you that in just a second. And we're gonna be looking for examples of TPAC, TIM, and UDL. Now, if you can find one video that is a good example of TPAC, one video that is a good example of Tim, and one video that's a good example of UDL when we get done with this, that's great. That's the idea. I've had students, though, who have gone out and said, well, I found this one video, and it fits TPAC and Tim, or it fits TPAC and UDL. Fine. Let's see what I mean here in just a second. Let me show you where the videos live. So this link right here, uh, and it's also right here. If you click on it, it will take you to a wiki. Uh, this wiki is created in something called PBWorks. Uh, the wikis that I used to use were created in something called wiki spaces are now gone, unfortunately. Uh, although I've grown really like uh, PBWorks. I, I like it for the reasons why I liked uh, wiki spaces. This is called Flat HTML, the source code is not hard to find. So if you're actually an HTML coder, you could actually go in and change things. Um, and I like the way that it has a very simple layout over here on the right. These are the pages. Um, here is Here is an example. You're a teacher ready to tap students into 21st century learning. But this is the video that I'd like you to watch that I think does in five minutes what I've just done in an hour. Um, and here is the original presentation. All right, uh, thanks, Glenn, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, Gerald, please, for the shirt. And um, without much ado, we move on to the introduction. Okay, I'm not going to keep doing that because I'm blowing you out. But here they are. Um, it's a really nice, it's 45 minutes long. But again, if you want to hear the theoretical, the research side of all of this, this is where it lives. It's a, it, it, you know, you could put it on, walk around, do something else, and just listen to it. It's good stuff. Okay. What I have over here is here's a link that will take us to Tim, and then we have one that takes us to UDL. But here's what I want you to see. When you go to technology in the classroom videos, what we have here are lots and lots and lots and lots of videos of people using technology in classrooms. And what I'm offering you is an opportunity here 
to take a look at these and find the ones that you think best represent the use of TPAC, TIM, and UDL. Now, some of these are very specific. In other words, they're in a computer lab. Let's see if I can find one of those real fast. It's the guy with the uh, planets, I think. Yeah, this one. So this one, the, you, you can see he's in a computer lab. Others are more um, kids in classrooms where technology is used. And some of these um, have UDL kind of uh, things in them. Although I'll be honest with you folks, it's hard to find UDL, good UDL videos. Uh, a lot of these are K-TIP, believe it or not, we can see that. And I got permission from the people who use them or who did them to be able to put them in here. Uh, some of these use smart boards. So you'll see that there's different kinds of technology use. Uh, and then I put in a few that are, to me, uh, so outrageous that I find them humorous. Um, and I'll let you find those as well. Okay, so what are we doing? Well, let's go back and look at the tool that we'll be using. And this is called Blend Space. Now, Blend Space, I like it because it's a very simple tool to use. Uh, again, you have my login to get into it, the sbswan02 at louisville.edu, password ULIT, I wish I could show that, I can't show that, um, ULIT241, so email address ULIT241, and you can log in. Now. Once you're in, what I want you to realize is, yes, we're, we're loving it. Thank you very much. Okay, right. Bye. Thank you. Once you get in, I hope what you're realizing is that if you want to use this, here you go. So here are people who are using it or have used it in the past with their kids. So you can go in. Why would I want to use your login, Steve, because you get you get access to everything. Simple as that. Uh, but if you want to use it with your own kids, you can create your own class over here, and then you can point them to that class, and they won't see anything else that's on here. They would do they would click on here and join class. I used to do this where we would have our own 585 class. In fact, I think one oh, it's still here, isn't it? Nope. Um, we used to use it for yeah. There it is. We used to do this. I don't do it anymore because it's just not necessary because you're going to create it and you're going to move it. All right, so here we go. I'm going to create a new lesson. I must, just like we did, remember the, the big caveat I gave you about um, making the infographic and pick to chart? We must put a title in first. Okay. So you can call it whatever you want. You could make it as, you know, Swans, TPAC, Tim, and UDL, however you want to call it, okay? But please, please, please do that because otherwise it won't save it. Now, again, this is one of those marvelous uh, ability to have uh, the autosave coming on so it doesn't get lost. One of the things that's cool up here you'll notice is you can go in and you can find standards. Uh, you can go in and find subjects. It's pretty cool that way. And this play button allows you to actually have it move through. Now let's look at what we've got here. We have boxes. In these boxes, as you can see, it says drop in your resources. So we can put in a text box. We can add a quiz, which is really interesting. Uh, and we can do resources. If you look over here on the right-hand side of the page, holy smokies, look what comes up. You can put resources in from YouTube. You can put resources in from the Google. 
You can put resources in from Google Images. You can search Flickr. You can put in a web page. You see where I'm, how I'm showing you here. And then you have settings. So what you have here is an ability to put in all kinds of stuff. And you could start up here if you just want to start with like the example they give here, oceans, not oceans. There we go. And you can do a search. And so what it does is it comes in and it gives you all kinds of resources that you can use in your Flynn space. Let me show you what I mean. So for continents and oceans, as you can see, it says it's a thorough interactive introduction to seven continents and five oceans. This presentation includes pictures and key terms. Enjoy. Go back. And now I can add that because it's free. I can put it into my resource over here. It's just that simple. Now, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking at those videos that we were just looking at. Okay, the ones you see. So I've put it in as a resource. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at those videos that we were looking at. I want to make sure to find it. Yeah. So if I want to use this video as an example of TPAC, if I go here and right click on it, copy the video URL just the URL now. I don't need to worry about code. I don't need to worry about any of that. Come back in here to my lesson. And I put that URL up here. Using the correct keyboard command. <laughs> I, just, I just used a Mac command. <laughs> okay. Then to do a search, boom, there it is. I can drag that over. Now, below it, I will add my text box where I can write and explain how I see that video being a really good example of TPAC. And my Grammy's coming in. Uh, this is my thinking about pack and once I get it done it shows up now you can add you don't need just to have six boxes here you can add as many boxes as you want um, the power of the thing is it, it's a two two-way street on the power kids do demonstrations of understandings as a teacher and you can see that right there I can also put in a quiz um, and I can make the quiz as long as I want. The only bad thing about the quizzes is it's multiple choices. And as you see, when we get into further into it, when we look at creating that ability to have these kinds of things, um, you know, you, th that world is so much more expanded now about putting assessment into place and we'll we'll get to that in an, another module okay so here we are eventually what we're going to end up doing oh have you noticed up there at the top in the middle it says auto saved right here so if, as long as i've put a name to it and i've given it uh you know it will save it and here we go you can share this lesson and so if you were doing this with your kids you could have them be logging in and they would land in your blend space class. And so therefore they would be putting it in. Looky, looky, looky. So you can create a blend space and put it over, straight over, if I click on it. And it says, share to what classroom? Steve. And when Steve clicks on it, those are all the Google classrooms that Steve belongs to. So you're not even having to necessarily go to the blend space, except to send kids there to do the creation pieces. The final understanding pieces get sent over to the Google classroom. 
Simple as that. Now for our purposes, and you know what we're gonna do because you already know the skinny now, don't you? You're gonna come up here and you are going to, oops, you are going to copy that lesson link to that thing that we just created and you're gonna put it over into your little Padlet. So let's go try it. Pop back into here. And you know, I need to clean this up. Hey Mark, I think I need to clean this one up. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna drop that into the link again, just like we did before. And when I do that, what it'll do is it'll do the run back and forth, run back and forth, run back and forth until it finally comes up with my blend space. I'm going to look at my friend across the table from me. We good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. This has been an exhausting <laughs> exploration of TPAC. I tell you all, uh, the reason why I feel like I have to do this is, first of all, uh, TPAC is the Tier 1 Research University of Louisville um, way of looking at technology integration in education. So I have to give it its due. When we do TIM and UDL next week, we'll spend very little time on TIM. Tim's, TIM is nothing more than a checkoff document where you sit down and watch somebody. UDL is where my heart lives, and you'll see it when I present on it. But now you've got the skinny. So all you're doing is you're going to go to that site that I've created that has everything in it about what we have just been talking about in terms of UDL and, uh, or excuse me, TPAC. So if you want to get a much deeper understanding of that, you know now that the, and that's where it is right here. I really, really urge everybody to watch this video right here. It's just beautiful job. Uh, but if you wanted to hear from the very get go, here it is right here. There it is. But now you also know that what we're asking you to do, and you now know where your videos are. They're right over here. Um, when we're ready, could I start this now, Steve? Why couldn't you? In other words, why couldn't you go in and create your blend space, give it a name, um, and put your first video in that you think represents the TPAC, and then write about it. Now, some people take that as a challenge when I say, if you can find one video that covers TPAC and TIM uh, and UDL, you go for it and find that one video. Uh, and other people will just go in and they'll do one video for TPAC, one video for Tim, one video for UDL. And that's fine. Any way you want to do it is just fine. And then when you're finished, you're going to take that uh, URL that it creates right here, and you're going to create a Padlet in our gallery walk, our virtual gallery walk, and you're going to place it in there. The takeaway about the blend space that I want you to, to realize is right there. You have the ability to create and blend space and have it simply, simply fall into your Google Classroom. If you'll take the time to set up the blend space, and this is why you need the Steve uh, password, because when you go in, you go in as an administrator and you're allowed to create your class in there. That way then your kids, when they log in, they would log in with their Google Classroom username and password so that when they're ready they click on that it'll come up and say your classroom your google classroom and they'll dump it over there into it okay i'm done mark you got a question yes, sir. all right i think we are good i think we've had a good explanation of the t-pack tonight as always if you have a question um you know how to reach me out there folks um oh did carrie come in no, Mark's been in. That's me. How are you finding that? Do you find working with it through the computer is better than looking at it up here on the screen? I bet tonight. Um, yeah, 
mean, it was a little, it was their small lag, but it wasn't anything. Major, yeah. So. The one thing I hate about doing PowerPoints through the collab is um, when you try to do an actual PowerPoint and have it fill the whole screen, it uh, it can get goofy. I mean, you can literally crash the computer. And that's why I don't show it that way. I just show it within each slide that's in there. Okay, we're done. Thank you all for being here. Again, last time, questions? 457-2937, shoot me a text. Bye now. Have a good uh, Friday.